the asset itself, the impact producing asset, which is the cook stove, um, which has its own digital credential, um, its certificate of manufacture that is then tokenized as an asset, which represents the rights to the carbon emission reduction credits to whoever owns the asset. And then we have funders, distributors, verification agents, and so on, who all have digital identifiers and um, verifiable credentials and profiles. And this builds up a, a graph of all these interrelated entities that are involved in the production and the verification and the financing of these carbon emission reductions. The end result is a carbon credit that is directly minted on-chain by the producers of the impacts. And this is quite a game changer. There is no central issuer of these carbon credits. Yo, what is good, Refi Nation? John here from Refi Dow. I'm very grateful to bring with you an episode with Dr. Sean Conway and Sean Ali Mohammadi from IXO. They're building a layer one blockchain on the Cosmos ecosystem, specifically designed for the tokenized impact economy. Dr. Sean was dreaming of this vision all the way back in 2008, working in development and aid, not really knowing the full potential of decentralized ledgers to enable a new world where people on the planet can actually live together in harmony. Sean Ali Mohammadi has been one of the pioneers in the local node movement as we've scattered seeds in cities all over the world, meeting regularly, inviting local leaders to join us and co-creating this vision of regeneration. In our episode today, we'll dive deep into some of the underlying logic behind the system that they've designed, look at the models that are broken in our existing impact economy today, and take a glimpse at some of the interventions they've made, bringing in artificial intelligence to accelerate and to improve the verifiability of the impact claims that are being made on the ground. It takes a bit of time to really dig deep into the system that they've built, but what you recognize is that they really have created an entire technology layer that is purpose-built for this economy. And by accessing both Asian and African markets, we can see large multi-billion dollar capital flows that are being made possible by these systems. We know through the declining growth of the voluntary carbon market that there's a decreasing amount of trust among corporate shareholders about the viability of the current models and methods that we use to verify impact claims in nature-based and engineered solutions around the world. But it still doesn't change the reality that we have to figure out a way to get capital into renewable energy, out of fossil fuels, and into preserving nature as opposed to destroying it. I hope in listening to this show, you can unlock some new insights and understanding about this vast world of impact and how distributed ledgers and artificial intelligence play a vital role in a transition to a regenerative future. Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome to the show. How are you feeling today, Sean Conway? Uh, what are you feeling grateful for? Uh, I've just traveled across the world. Um, I've just arrived in Singapore just really yesterday, having spent some time with the team. And um, I'm grateful for how interconnected we are across the planet um, and uh, for the people that we're connected to. Man, I love it. Did you offset your emissions of that flight? Just curious. <laughs> <laughs> really great question. I'm doing, I'm doing that with my supermoto Nifty. Oh, nice. Um, which nice. we can talk about later. Can't yeah. wait to get into that, dude. I love it. Uh, Sean Ali Mohammadi, how are you feeling today, sir? All good. Thanks, John. Uh, lovely to be here with you both. And I'm um, stoked to be on the podcast. I'm grateful for many things today. <laughs> I was recounting everything last night and this morning. I won't go through the whole list, nice. but uh, I'm grateful for <laughs> sunshine and blue skies. Mate, well, I'm just super grateful for a chance to talk to two true pioneers of the regenerative finance space. I know, Dr. Sean, you've been in this movement longer than basically anybody else. You've seen it all, all the highs, all the lows, and you seem somehow unfazed and just steadfast in your conviction to build this tokenized impact economy. Uh, and I'm really curious also to dive into what's happening in Cape Town, what you guys have enabled with IXO. I know you've got some incredible pilots and case studies, really demonstrating the power of this technology for real world problems, which you guys both know is what I care about. Um, but before we jump in, we've been playing around with just a short meditation to kick off the show. So uh, inviting you both and anyone listening to just, yeah, take a second. We'll do a quick two minutes. Um, I'm going to put some gentle music on. You can uh, take a seat and close your eyes and uh, we'll just go into flow. As the music rises, becoming aware of the gentle breath. This incredible gift that we receive every single day.
feeling the rhythmic rise and release in our chest and belly. The weight of Mother Earth pulling us down into our chair. The sense of gravity, all of nature held by the same massive spinning ball of life. You can take a moment just to imagine in your mind's eye all the thousands of listeners all over the world taking two minutes out of their day to pause and breathe. Amidst a burning planet with ecosystems and collapse, systemic injustice and greed. And yet, here we are, standing firm in our conviction to make the world a better place for our children and for their children using the most powerful tools of our time. So with this framing, I'd invite us all to just take three deep breaths together, starting fully in through your nose. And letting go, long, slow exhale. Fully in through your nose. Last deep breath in, straight into your heart, all that gratitude, the gift of being alive. And here we go. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Thanks, guys, for rolling awesome. with it. Oh, I appreciate it. It's such a, <laughs> such a gift for me. Uh, one of the most favorite parts of my day. Um, Sean, I'd love to have you kick this off. I feel like you are a man with a mission and you see things that other people don't see. Uh, can you just give us an overview of this opportunity that you describe as the tokenized impact economy? Yeah, so this, um, this is really about imagining a world in which we value the things that um, count um, and we count what matters. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's a sort of simple uh, kind of tagline, I guess. Um, but when we actually delve into it and we really start to see that we can begin to um, uh, to measure and count the things that we just previously have just taken for granted. Um, and so the things that are called externalities in the financial system um, and that we're now, uh, those of us who are more conscious, um, are kind of aware of and know the importance of. And so how do we bring that into what we... Um, consider the economy, you know, where, whether we have kind of new economy ideals or we, we operate in, in the traditional economy, uh, in co economies. Um, how do we bring this value in? How do we appreciate it? How do we measure it? And how do we transact with it in ways that we can build a new direction for, um, for humanity mm. based on sound economic principles? Um, and um, really, this is all about the underlying data, kind of like actually understanding the world through what we are able to um, to put into into a tokenized form. Mm. Um, so tokenization is so powerful because it enables us to um, bring together data, verify the data, yeah. put a value on the data, pricing, etc., and also embed rights. And so this is a big part of the story. So we're not just talking about commodities here. We're talking about um, how these uh, these tokens enable us to operationalize different rights. Mm. And um, if we kind of look at the sustainable development goals, they're essentially a set of um, cons consensus um, statements, agreements made by probably the largest consensus um, mechanism in the world, the UN and its related mm -hmm. institutions, um, through probably the largest consensus agreement, which is the, the global goals. Um, and this is really embedded on a system of rights, you know, rights to education, rights to health, mm. 
et cetera, et cetera. And so including um, the rights of nature and so on. And so, um, so using tokenization to operationalize rights, distribute rights um, within this economy is a really powerful concept. Yeah, and it's an interesting framing because it, it seems so simple, you know, to just <laughs> measure what counts and to count what matters and to really take stock of what humans actually need to survive. And yet we live in this world where our entire economy just seems to be blind, completely unaware of what you know we need for human and for planetary health. I'd be curious, Sean Ali, to just get your take on how we got here to this place, how this economic system has arisen, and how we've somehow managed to get to 8 billion people on the planet without really knowing you know, our monetary system, what matters for you know, human and planetary health. Sure, that's a big question. Um, but you know, I think we've landed up in a place today um, you know, with rising human population, decreasing resource availability, you know, perpetual rising inequality um, because of economic systems uh, that extract value, don't create value. Um, now in Africa and Asia, we've got some of the fastest growing populations. Um, I think Africa is a continent of youth as well, but projected to have about 40% of the global population by 2100, according to the United Nations. And, you know, the difficulty with this is how do we look after all of those human beings, um, provide them with essential services, food, energy, uh, water, housing, good education. That's why I'm interested in this space because I think that there there are solutions here. Hmm. And that's what excites me. Uh, Solutions that can replace existing uh, forms of uh, political and economic um, arrangements and entanglements are more transparent um, and hopefully more democratic. uh, and More just, yeah. Yeah, values are life-supporting systems. Uh, social and ecological systems uh, that the previous economy has not. Yeah, man. And we're suffering from it, you know, day to day. I think um, here in Europe, the hottest (laughs) summer on record, we're really feeling this place. And, you know, the idea of tokenizing impact is, is painfully simple in a way. But I'm curious how you actually arrived at this epiphany, um, Sean Conway. What was the moment where you said, hey, you know, actually, there's this really simple intervention to tokenize the impact, to have publicly verifiable proof of making good in the world. Where did that come from your journey? And then I'd love to jump into a little bit more around the technology, how it works, and really the full system that you guys have designed at IXO. So um, my my first part of my career was working in um, healthcare and uh, global health and um um, medical service delivery. Mm. And so um, I sort of had a lot of experience of legacy systems in terms of the information, how things get um, get evaluated, um, and also um, kind of how money flows through, particularly the international development system, mm. um, have uh, written a lot, a lot of large grant applications and been successful in running large grant funded programs and um, uh, corporate funded programs and so on. Um, the the huge shift around 2008 was towards this idea of um, outcome based funding or results based funding. Um, so partly it was brought on by uh, by the austerity measures. Um, Gordon Brown, I think, was a, a big sort of leader in this. Sure. Um, but it was also really about kind of um, creating new forms of aid delivery um, that were value for money driven and uh, outcomes or results are uh, kind of based. And so um, when we look at kind of how we record those outcomes, the systems are really very poor um, mm-hmm. in terms of um, evaluating and uh, recording um, some sort of certified results. Um, the sort of uh, uh, analog ana- um, analog- analogy of um, this is certificates. You know? And so we've got a whole lot of certificate-based Systems. You know, when I graduated from medical school, I got my graduation certificate. Um, I got my license to practice, um, and um, and uh, you know, if we look at the carbon um, credit system, it's all based on certificates. And so, I thought if we were able to create digital versions of those um, certified outcomes, and then um, bring with that the 
capabilities of digital systems mm. to um, essentially bring the rights. So when you have a certificate, like I, I have a medical certificate um, um, and I, I can therefore practice medicine. So sure. it gives me rights. Legitimacy with and it so, as well, yeah. Right, right. And so if we can, if we can operationalize these rights um, in ways that um, they are uh, kind of disintermediated um, from, uh, from the gatekeepers to us being able to use our rights, then we're able to I think, get a lot more access and a lot more scalability um, around uh, uh, kind of people with the uh, and projects and funders and so on. Whoever's generating outcomes can now have um, additional rights around receiving funding or uh, claiming benefits um, or um, um, uh, having uh, kind of rights to operate in the system. And it's interesting you described 2008 being the turning point at which you know results-based funding kind of shifted into the mainstream. And I find it fascinating that it almost is this conscious evolution as we have new ideas, the systems around us change. But it was also the moment of the financial collapse as well as the emergence of peer-to-peer -peer internet money through Bitcoin. So where did you begin to weave these two systems together, this idea of results-based you know, funding and also you know, decentralized public ledgers to actually be able to prove those certificates and their legitimacy? So in, in 2008, I was working for the UK government uh, Department for International Development um, as an advisor within the policy and research division in London. And uh, so I was invited to speak at a conference um, in, in 2008, um, which was focused on how Web2 technologies could be used to improve aid delivery. So it was very much a, a narrative at that time about aid. You know, you had Bob Geldof um, and, his, um, and uh, Tony Blair and so on, Aid for Africa. Um, so, uh, and this Millennium Development Goals. Um, so I gave a presentation at this conference uh, saying, okay, well, we need to change the model for how um, capital gets to where it's needed and how data gets to the decision makers and decentralize this model. So there's a, a presentation um, on SlideShare from 2008 um, based on the presentation I gave at this conference uh, where I essentially described the system that we've now implemented. Wow. So it was about um, changing this from being a centrally um, uh, controlled supply chain, which is broken, of mm -hmm. sending capital from central uh, sort of sources of capital down to where they're supposedly uh, going to be used, um, and then uh, the supply chain of data from where the interventions are implemented back up to where decisions were typically being made. Mm -hmm. And so I envisaged a system where we could decentralize the the whole resource allocation mechanism, um, the information flows and the feedback loops, um, and said we could create something like an eco-credit. Uh, so <laughs> this was pre-blockchain. so ahead of your no, time. No tokens. Wow, so ahead <laughs> um, of your time. And uh, yeah, and so I, I, I had this idea about share stakeholders. Now we, I guess we'd call them token holders. Mm. Um, and that you could accumulate eco-credits uh, if you were successful in making decisions about projects that achieved results, mm. there would be a dividend of these eco credits, which would give your decision making power a boost within the system. Um, and essentially, it's kind of token curated, uh, kind of uh, governance uh, type mechanisms, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and also economic mechanisms that work at a very, very decentralized level with these tight feedback loops between um, the the, the financing decisions and the and the data that gets collected uh, to know what's actually um, resulting, and so um, great idea in two thousand and eight. Um, I I then tried to implement something along these lines, and uh, I did a little bit of an experiment with um, local currencies, mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was kind of the the technology at the time that seemed to be the way that you could decentralize these funding flows. But uh, unfortunately, very quickly realized that, um, you know, I didn't have the legitimacy to run a local ledger. Um, so although you know, technology was available, there was no kind of legitimacy in terms of political process and social consensus and mm -hmm. so on um, to be able to do this. And so I kind of parked the whole idea and got on with some other big projects. And, uh, uh, and then in 2013, um, I was on a bit of a sabbatical 
um, literally lying on a hammock. I know this sounds a, a little bit cliche. That's where all the best ideas um, come from, man. Uh, Hammocks and showers. That's where it's yeah, at. Yeah. So I was in Sri Lanka um, surfing the web and I came across the Satoshi white paper and I literally yes. jumped on the hammock and I was like, <laughs> wow, it. okay, Eureka, <laughs> this is it. You know, and now here's a system where we can put um, financial transfers and the information about um, the transactions uh, about, about the results that are being achieved onto the same ledger. So we can get financial accounting and performance accounting onto the same ledger. Hmm. And that seemed like a really simple thing to do. Um, and so I was like, yeah, let's do this. <laughs> and so uh, beginning of 2014, um, started implementing our first projects. And uh, then uh, as we began to look at the technology at the time, um, it was already very apparent to us that Bitcoin wasn't going to be the ledger that we could use sure. um, because our first use case was around tracking um, preschool or uh, kindergarten attendance for a government subsidy scheme in South Africa. And so we would have completely spammed the network um, if we had uh, recorded <laughs> all of these <laughs> transactions uh, on Bitcoin. And so we we implemented our first proof of concept on the Ripple blockchain. Okay, I didn't really know that, man. You guys go way back. I, I'd love to go deeper into where you guys are at now, the use cases that are possible, some of the projects and case studies demonstrating the power of this tech. But I just want to check super quickly with you, Sean Ali. I think it's always a, a great um, snippet to hear what people's aha moment was, where they recognize, okay, this is what this technology can do, and I'm all in. What was that for you? Where were you? How old? And yeah, what was that moment? I think um, my aha moment went back to when I was in second year of university. I was doing uh, become entrepreneurship and economics and philosophy. And it was during the water crisis uh, in Cape Town. We experienced a drought in, I think it was 2016 or 17. And mm-hmm. um, I had the realization that oh, the water is such an important resource. How can we better manage this? Um, what innovations are around to to better manage this resource? Um, and then decided that I was going to get into uh, social ecological innovations. It wasn't blockchain in particular, but that was the moment when I realized, okay, for this life, this is what I'm going to be involved in. It's going to be this direction. That's beautiful. I love it. And I think it's interesting that you guys have tried out different technologies to be able to fulfill this kind of blueprint that you had back in 2008. I'd love us to fast forward to where we are now, Sean. You know, what is Ixo? What can you do with it? And then we can unpack the underlying technology and the system that you've designed. Excellent. Yeah. So, um, so, so where we've evolved from since um, 2014, um, based on uh, our understanding of the needs um, of real world use cases, is we ended up building our own blockchain, um, so using the Cosmos SDK. And our, our choice around that in 2017 was really based on the need to have sovereign uh, blockchain um, and uh, uh, enable other organizations to also have their own networks. Um, so really thinking about this as a network of networks, as an internet of impacts. Mm. Um, so sort of realizing that one chain does not meet the needs of of every use case, and um, but we need to have interoperability, and we need to be able to um, connect all these networks um, across public and private chains, institutions, um, uh, public networks, etc. And um, so, um, why did we build our own chain? Well, we we started down the process of developing a core internet protocol. Um, um, for uh, the data layer of the impacts economy. And um, so this is really about, firstly, um, having identifiers. So you can identify all of the entities involved in the process of delivering, financing, verifying, um, accessing um, anything related to impact. Um, And so our initial uh, kind of foray into that was to create these UIDs um, as digital identifiers, and then we got involved in the rebooting the Web of Trust um, process um, uh, community group in 2015. And that ended up becoming decentralized identifiers, mm. EIDs. Oh, wow. um, and uh, so we made, we made a significant contribution to that. Um, and we're one of the initial methods um, for DIDs um, back in 2015, 2016. So you need to have identifiers um, and then you need to have structured 
data that is verifiable. And so um, the verifiable claims and verifiable credentials standards, which are based on um, structured and graph-based data, um, really were incredibly well suited to what we needed to um, implement in terms of um, the data layer. And so um, although the, the Rebooting Web of Trust and the W3C um, Verifiable Credentials Working Group were mostly focused on um, the credential side of things mm -hmm. and on identifying people and organizations, um, I um, made a proposal that we could actually uh, use the same data models and the same structured data um, with the verification mechanisms to make observations about things in the world. Mm. Um, and so that turned out to be a really good choice because um, those, um, those have become internet standards through the W3C. And um, having structured data, particularly verified structured data, is really the, 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 the kind of feedstock of AI systems and intelligence systems. So um, we, we needed an infrastructure to enable um, the uh, issuance and sort of registries of digital identifiers and of verifiable credentials and claims, and nothing like that really existed. And uh, if we look at most blockchains, they're really designed for financial transactions. Um, they're not really there as data registries. True. Uh, and so the Cosmos SDK really uh, served us well in terms of um, being uh, customizable and, and configurable for, for, um, for, the, for the protocol uh, to be executed and to store the data that's needed in these trusted data registries. And so these underlying kind of technical building blocks that you've set standards for the digital identifiers, verifiable credentials, and then the ability to you know, determine whether or not uh, that claim is true in the real world are kind of these piping mechanisms that enable you to do what specific you know, use cases in the real world. I know you guys are anchored to the most pressing challenges of our time, but I'm curious to know, you know what specifically and what is the size of this market that you're talking about here? Yeah, so, um, so really what we're talking about here is creating digital representations of the state of the world um, and then um, recording the changes in the state that happen in ways that we, we can attribute um, the changes to the interventions that we implement, the organizations that are involved in the process of bringing about those changes, um, either sort of positively or negatively, uh, and then attributing value to the changes. Mm. And so really, if we... And to expand this out into a much bigger vision, it's, um, it's creating a trusted record of everything that happens in the world. Um, as now, obviously, that's like way beyond what IXO can, um, can, uh, can provide. Um, and so we, we've, uh, I, I believe, um, contributed some very sort of fundamental core uh, uh, thinking around um, how we can use the structured data. But in terms of the use cases that we've been pursuing to um, prove this out. Um, so we have um, projects in, in uh, education. So we, we implemented a, a pilot with UBS Bank and the UBS Optimus Foundation, mm -hmm. um, which was a year-long um, uh, primary education initiative, um, financing education outcomes from an intervention where the, um, the kids had tablet devices and uh, essentially the financing mechanism was funding um, the means of production of impact, mm. um, in this case, educational outcomes, okay. and, uh, and then the claims coming both from the devices in terms of the progress that the children were making, mm -hmm. as well as the baseline versus endpoint outcome claims um, were, were then uh, independently verified. So that's an, an example of a social intervention. Um, the uh, The very big initiative we've been working on is around fuel switching. Um, so um, if we look at the, the uh, budget for carbon um, from the IPCC report, about 80% of that comes from um, non-nature-based uh, kind of na uh, solutions. And so there's a mm -hmm. huge emphasis at the moment, um, particularly in refi, on nature-based solutions. Sure. But actually 80% um, of, of the carbon budget needs to come from changing how we use fuel, mm. um, how we produce fuel, and so on. Um, and so we started in 2018 with the use case of clean cooking. Mm. So this is switching from, um, uh, from burning charcoal and, 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 uh, and, and wood and other traditional fuels or fossil fuels 
um, to clean burning um, renewable biomass uh, cookstoves, uh, which have huge benefits in terms of health um, because they reduce the fumes and the emissions sure. um, that cause uh, lung disease, um, but also um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Mm. And so the project we started in 2018 with gold standard um, finally has come to fruition uh, without Amazing. gold standard at this stage. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, and, uh, and has manifest as, as, in, as the emerging eco platform. And so what this enables is um, direct tokenization of the verified claims relating to uh, carbon emission reductions resulting from um, the switch to clean cooking devices. Um, so how this works is um, families in Africa, for instance, so there's, um, um, like, let's say, 10,000 users um, across uh, Zambia, Mozambique, and Malawi um, that have been uh, um, given uh, clean, clean cooking devices, modern energy devices, which uh, many of them have IoT sensors embedded in them. Very cool. When, when those um, families make the purchases of their renewable biomass fuel, which is basically this pelletized mm -hmm. um, uh, um, uh, kind of uh, fuel made from, from waste products, mm -hmm. um, the transaction um, record of the fuel purchase becomes a claim. Um, and then that gets verified against the IoT data coming off of the wow. sensor of the, of the cook stove. Yeah. And so um, what we do with this is create a digital twin of the system. Hmm. So we have um, all of the entities involved, um, the, um, uh, the, the asset itself, the impact producing asset, which is the cook stove, um, which has its own digital credential, um, its certificate of manufacture. Um, that is um, then tokenized as an asset. Um, which represents the rights to the carbon emission reduction uh, credits um, to whoever owns the asset. And, um, and then we have uh, uh, funders, distributors, verification agents, and so on, who all have digital identifiers and um, verifiable credentials and profiles. And this builds up um, a, a graph of all these interrelated entities that are involved in the production and the verification and the financing um, of these carbon emission reductions. The end result is a carbon credit um, that is directly um, minted on chain by the producers of the impacts. And this is quite a game changer. Um, there is no central issuer of these carbon credits. Super cool. uh, the, the protocol enables you to um, transfer the rights of um, issuing the carbon credits mm. Uh, if you have a verifiable credential of the emission reduction uh, proof that has um, come through this process, and so the digital certificate gets embedded into the uh, into the carbon token, and that gets minted directly on chain. I don't think I knew how comprehensive the system was that you guys had designed, and also to know that it's being used to measure education outcomes is so fascinating. Like it really does seem as though you guys have taken a first principles view on impact as a whole and designed the technology to really serve the needs of that. Whereas I think so many other projects are kind of saying, here's the tech, we're going to smash impact into it and hope it fits. So kudos to you guys for doing the deep, hard legwork and you know persevering through intermediaries that give legitimacy and obviously have the best interests in mind. But at the end of the day, there's so many factors you know, that keep people in or out of any given initiative. And you guys are coming all the way full circle with, with the Clean Cook Stove Project. And I know there's other things in the horizon. Love to talk about what's coming next. But I'm curious, Sean, Ali, you're very active in the refi ecosystem. You know, somebody who's out in the wild, connecting with loads of different projects and people but also you know, rooted in real-world challenges on the ground in Cape Town and beyond. I'm curious to get your take on why some project would choose IXO over another existing distributed ledger technology, IXO versus Regen Network or IXO versus Hedera. Like, what does it offer and who is it specifically for in the market? How do you see that? I think I started at IXO last year after working at an education project. So it was um, similar to the Chumpel pilot that Sean mentioned where students um, address their learning gaps in maths and English. And I was going around all of these different schools. Uh, there's also a business uh, or financial literacy course as well. And I was looking at the world around me thinking that it's quite hectic um, and that there is available capital out there uh, for 
um, positive outcomes, public and planetary goods. Um, and yeah, came across the EXO platform um, and with my limited understanding saw that there were kind of use cases that were already being implemented. Um, mm. And after speaking to Sean, I saw that there were some real projects that were using these innovative mechanisms and systems and digital tools. Um, so I think, you know, to answer your question, um, it's, it's the software infrastructure is there uh, and it's ready for projects to utilize. I'm curious to get your take on this, Sean, because it does sound like a similar architecture to what Hedera has implemented at The Guardian. And I know Region Network has, you know, a similar take, but they may not have gone as deep into the IoT. Like, where do you see yourself in the market in the context of these other providers who are really providing a more holistic approach to impact claims and verification? So, um, so there, there's two parts to this. Um, firstly, we needed to build the public infrastructure because it didn't exist. Okay. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy that there are um, other projects out there that have been contributing to this and also have parts of the um, interconnected network infrastructure, the public digital infrastructure that we need. It can't just be one chain. It can't be just one, one, uh, one group of, of individuals. Um, it really needs to be um, you know, a, uh, a, a, a network of networks approach. And so the original idea was always around an internet of impacts, which would be a multi-chain infrastructure. And so I believe um, Ixo Network, the way that we've configured it as a blockchain, um, provides <clears throat> many of the services that are needed for, um, for the specific use cases and capabilities that we provide as Ixo. Uh, but really important in the design is the ability to tap into the services and communities and liquidity and so on of other networks. And so this has really been designed as a multi-chain mm. infrastructure. Um, the, the blockchain is, is only one relatively small part of what Exo has built. Okay. On top of that, we have data stores, um, we have client SDKs and applications, mobile and web applications, wallets, um, mobile wallet integration with the Opera browser, mobile uh, mobile browser, um, so um, it's really been about okay, how do we create an end to end kind of technology stack that works for real world use cases? Mm. Um, but um, ultimately, we don't want to be uh, kind of owning and managing this whole infrastructure stack. It's far too much for any one organization to um, to be able to manage. And so we feel like we've. We've really achieved a lot in terms of demonstrating that this works and how it works and, and having um, hopefully contributed um, some uh, thinking to other groups that um, are now building out other parts of, of the infrastructures um, that they need um, and that collectively can all interconnect. Um, so part of uh, what we've done recently is to uh, launch the um, uh, Venture Cooperative, um, which is the impact style as an ecosystem um, that enables us to work much more cooperatively in funding um, and developing the technologies as well as the um, go-to-market um, opportunities with, within this ecosystem. So that's a kind of one, one part of the mission was to build this out, prove it out, um, and connect it to what everyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. And so we're kind of at a, an important um, inflection point around that um, and um, <clears throat> have thrown all of the open source assets as well as uh, the majority of the EXO tokens, which mm -hmm. were held by um, by the foundation and so on, thrown that all into the Impact Star as a cooperative, as a bit of a kind of hopefully honeypot um, kind of contribution to say to others, please come in, join the initiative, and um, let's build this cooperative ecosystem all together. So that's one part of it. Um, we've also set up um, EXO as a commercial entity in Singapore recently. Mm -hmm. uh, and the focus there is on building um, what I wrote about in 2020, I think it was, in the white paper, um, prediction oracles. Um, so this is using mm -hmm. AI capabilities to be able to do, in the first instance, proofing of claims, because that's the most sort of immediate utility that we need um, is um, to take data in, in the format of these verifiable claims, evaluate um, the claims, and um, and then... Um, provide verification for digital MRV. Um, but beyond that, 
<clears throat> there are many other use cases of the data. Um, I call them P functions. Um, so it can be personalization, um, planning, um, uh, protection, uh, prevention of threats, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, and these are all sort of AI um, mediated capabilities um, that we're focusing on from, from XO um, as a commercial entity uh, providing into the network. So this is kind of a services layer um, on top of the core infrastructure. Interesting. And is that part of the kind of uh, straddling between the African and Asian markets that you see there's a capital flow here that you're accessing? Can you describe what is the opportunity? What are you seeing? And what's the strategy that you're employing to harness? Yeah, so, so we're working across um, uh, opportunities in a few different sectors. Um, the, <clears throat> the first big one is um, around fuel switching and particularly where that involves metered and measured um, devices um, mm-hmm. because there are some... Sure. Um, methodologies for deriving carbon credits, water credits, and so on um, using um, uh, metered devices and uh, the data flows that come from transactions relating to the usage of the of those technologies or um, from the IoT devices. And so we've already spoken about uh, cook stoves. That's a very large um, opportunity space. Um, we believe that it very definitely has um, a one gigaton potential um, across the regions of the world where traditional cooking is still predominantly the way that people um, cook their meals on a daily basis. And mm-hmm. um, so that, that's really um, you know, 2.3, between 2.3 and 2.6 billion people. It's huge. Um, and the carbon emissions from, from traditional cooking are on a par with the um, uh, commercial airline industry. Wow. You know, so so th- this is hugely significant, Massive, yeah. um, and it causes a lot of environmental destruction and um, has um, negative health impacts um, and so on. So, so huge impact um, potential um, as well as huge commercial potential. Uh, you know, a, a gigaton is a billion tons of carbon, and um, so you know, do the maths around that. It's it's really very significant in terms of. Mm the capital flows that could be enabled by these technologies if we could tap into that size of market. Um, and we, we, we really think that um, kind of having done our financial modeling and projections, that that is really um, uh, within reach. Um, uh, adjacent to clean cooking are other energy um, or fuel switch um, technologies, such as moving from um, uh, uh, gasoline or diesel powered um, water pumps for solar irrigation um, into solar powered irrigation. Mm. And uh, there are companies um, that we're busy working with right now in Africa and Asia, in Southeast Asia, um, who provide these kinds of technologies. Um, water purification is another really huge use case. Um, think about the billions of people who don't have, have access to clean water. Yeah. Um, and uh, we either have to buy bottled water or boil their water. And so boi- boiling water is one of the most energy-intensive activities. And um, if this is done on traditional um, fuel sources, it emits huge amounts of uh, carbon. And so switching to water purification um, technologies that, that are highly efficient, extremely cost-effective, mm. uh, it's providing clean water to villages and schools, you know, is is really a massive opportunity, um, and then adjacent to that, the the kind of water technologies that will make water available to recycling and so on within water stressed regions. Um, we're also working on um, e mobility, uh, so switching from uh, sort of gas powered um, vehicles to uh, to electric vehicles. Um, so you can sort of see a common theme here, where um, if you're able to measure it and you're able to bring um, sort of data streams from these uh, these metered devices mm. um, into into the system, and we we have um, a causal AI uh, mechanism that automates the evaluation of the claims as they come through, it's it's really fast, really scalable, it's really cost effective, and so um, we can really in each of these sectors create a flywheel um, for financing the scale up. And this is super important in terms of the compounding impacts that it has. Yeah. So if we think about um, the traditional uh, ways of uh, generating carbon credits, which um, have a huge upfront cost, take about 18 months for any 
uh, monetization on the carbon credits that are generated. Um, you know, you're waiting 18 months to two years to be able to buy your next cook stove or your next water pump or whatever. Right. Whereas, whereas with, with the system that um, we've created, it's literally real time. You can submit a claim, you can purchase the fuel today, you can submit a claim today, and the carbon credit is on chain today. And it's really cheap. And there's growing appetite for buyers in the market who really see and appreciate you know, the integrity of these impact assets with all of the data availability that you provide. Absolutely. So you know, what backs up each of these, um, in, um, these uh, credits is um, a verifiable credential and that has a graph of data. Um, and uh, it's pretty cool if you go on our interface you can click through all the way down to indiv individual claims, um, individual fuel purchases, um, the organizations that are involved, and you can go all the way to their credentials. You can look at the cook stove. You can see the mm. certificate of manufacture as a verifiable credential. So there's an entire graph of verified data backing up um, the claim okay. to this carbon credit. Wow. And uh, you know, kind of given, given the justifiable critique of the uh, methodologies that have been used in the nature-based carbon credit production um, and now within the cook stove sector. Yep. Uh, there, by the time this episode is out, there will probably have been another Guardian article um, and, <laughs> and publication <laughs> in, in, uh, science, um, in the Science Journal yeah. um, based on very rigorous research about over-crediting in the cook stove sector. Mm, mm. And so for, for the buyers of carbon credits, you know, if you're a enlisted company or, um, you know, have, um, uh, have a need to kind of justify your purchases and demonstrate that you're buying quality credits, um, there are actually really few options available. Uh, and, uh, and so we really believe that you know, we're kind of raising the bar. And uh, you know, if it's not necessarily credits that are bought through this process, mm -hmm. at least this sets the new standard. So um, totally, and, and yeah, I mean, it really is an order yeah. of magnitude different quality dimension and system because you have the full audit totally. trail, and otherwise yeah. it's a black box, and you're basically trusting somebody else's stamp and seal of approval who has been increasingly called into question through various sources with very legitimate research and observation. And so I think you guys are really tapping into an explosive, you know, capital flow here. You know, we looked at a recent McKinsey study that shows we're going to be spending, you know, 140 to 240 trillion dollars by 2050 to stabilize our climate and maintain the Paris targets. And okay, we aren't now, but it's because all of the corporate demand says the instruments there we don't trust. And if you're building a really deep, you know, system with integrity that people can trust. I mean, this could be a major unlock of capital flows for smaller projects all over the world, which is really where this is at. It's not the big, massive scale. It's the smaller everyday folks. And so I'd love um, in our conversation to shift a little bit into some of the stuff that you guys are seeing on the ground in Cape Town. I think maybe we wrap up the conversation with what you're really excited about at IXO moving forward, how people can get involved. If there's any corporate listeners that want to get in touch, how people can reach you. But Sean, I'm curious to lay the groundwork for Cape Town as a place in Africa, the historical context, before we jump into you know, the problems that you guys are seeing and the role that you feel Reefify Cape Town can play, enabled by the technology that IXO provides. So can you just give us a high-level you know, brushstroke for somebody who doesn't really know much about Cape Town in terms of what is the place and why is it so you know, important in the context of regeneration as a whole? Um, so Cape Town is... Part of South Africa, um, which has got a troubled history um, with mm. apartheid only ending in 1994, 28 years ago. So fairly recent. Uh, apartheid was the institutionalization of racism. Um, mm. Not that institutions around the world are not, not racist anymore. Uh, racism still exists in a systemic uh, fashion. But Cape Town and South Africa um, is, as a result, um, one of the most unequal places uh, in the world. It's got the highest Gini coefficient, according to the World Bank. Um, so when we talk about a small percentage of individuals earning the majority of the wealth, is really evident here. Uh, geographically, the urban plan uh, has been kind of built around the CBD uh, where um, 
white people used to live and black people would live on the outskirts in townships. Um, I guess it's not a unique thing to to Cape Town and South Africa and there are many other cities across the world that have that kind of uh, structured inequality. But yeah, it's really present here uh, and the effects of apartheid are still lingering. So there's still uh, high socioeconomic inequalities uh, across traditional lines education, gender, uh, space, et cetera, et cetera, wealth. So that's kind of the situation on the ground, and we're still grappling with these problems um, in in service delivery and access to basic services. A lot of people still struggle. A lot of people still living on the bread line. We've got a, an extremely high unemployment rate. Um, formerly, it's about 30%, 35%, but you know, in some areas, it could be 50, 60 percent unemployment. Um, so wow. there's a real development conundrum. Um, mm. And at the same time, we are facing threats of climate change, uh, water shortage, erratic weather conditions. It's getting hotter, the winters are getting uh, colder. Um, mm. And there's more and more people being born every day uh, into this world. Uh, we've got one of the fastest uh, population growths as well. So when we speak about rising population, is a lot of those people are being born here. It's not so much Europe or North America and Asia is growing, but uh, it's predicted that Africa will, the pace of population growth will, will, will outlast uh, Asian population growth. So that's the context. It's such a rich context to which to explore creating a local node. And I'm curious, like, what gravitated you personally and also Ixo as an organization towards, you know, being a part of this network that we're cultivating together at Refi DAO? Yeah, so I've always been interested and drawn to initiatives, projects and networks and people and organizations that experiment with uh, and tinker with new technologies that have, you know, high potential for social and environmental innovation. So when I heard about the Refi Local Node call for proposals, I thought, heck, I've got to apply for this uh, and assemble a group of local actors, people who are in the space of impact and uh, youth development. A lot of it has been around uh, youth-led solutions. Uh, so Refi, or our local node is a youth-led node. I um, love that. And, you know, the initial idea, like many of the other nodes, was to host monthly meetings uh, and community mm. gatherings where we bring different people together. Uh, you know, and I'm proud to say that we've got an incredibly diverse group of people at the, lo- at the Cape Town local node from all different, yes, you know, places uh, and ages. And yeah, it's just really, really cool to see different people coming together because I think Diversity is definitely strength. Uh, perhaps that's a cliche, but it is really cool just to get different no, perspectives the, there. The science shows it's clear. It's the key driver of innovation. You know, the most innovative teams always are the most diverse across the multitude of dimensions. So you've got these people from all sorts of walks of life showing up, but what's drawing them? Like I know what it is in Lisbon, but why are people showing up? And like, what's galvanizing you guys forward? And what, what's the dream and vision of regeneration in Cape Town? I think what's drawing people, um, different reasons. Some people are excited about the technology uh, and use cases mm. for new technology. While maybe about 70% of the other people are there for upskilling almost. And uh, they're mm. seeing opportunity for em- employment or wealth creation. Um, True. In, in some, yeah, in, in a space that is problem solving as well. Yeah, totally. And there's this kind of co-creative spirit, which I feel like you guys are embodying with the hackathon coming up, people being able to submit in person or online, really trying to just throw all the problems into a pot and figure out what are the right tools we can use? How can we solve this? And I think there's this interesting dimension where, you know, Web3 communities are so incredibly welcoming. It does seem a bit odd from the outside because there's a bit lingo and sometimes in other contexts, it's a little bit, you know, homogenistic, not as diverse as we'd hoped. But actually what I've found is it's very inclusive, inviting and, you know, deeply trusting community of people who have a shared vision of the future. And I think, you know, with the collapse of a lot of religious institutions and kind of faith as a whole, 
within society, you know, many people are looking for that kind of third place where they can belong. It's not their home. It's not their work. It's where they go outside of it. And they know that they can just show up and be themselves, be a part of something special. And maybe it ends up that they find an amazing lucrative job out of it or a super cool place to live with great friends. But I'm, I'm curious to understand more around like the culture of Refi Cape Town and what problems you guys are really diving in to solve because there's such a big landscape that you just described there and you can't take it all on. So is there something that you're really feeling drawn to, you know, start with small and build momentum? Yeah, so we are still very young, having only started a few months ago, but we've come quite a long way. Um, you know, we've we've got a website up now and um, we've hosted two events. We've got a hackathon in the pipeline to catalyze the local uh, tokenized economy. Um, with a campaign online called Refi This, where people nice. take pictures of uh, challenges in their community and uh, hashtag That's Refi awesome. This. And then part of the hackathon is to develop a solution to that problem. And there oh, are cool. so many problems in, in Cape Town. Underneath all of them is an even, even bigger opportunity, uh, creative mm. opportunity to be untapped. So I'm really excited for, for the upcoming hackathon and I uh, really encourage any teams who are interested in these themes. Uh, you don't even need to be a software developer. Uh, you just need to be a problem solver and open thinker. Um, submit entries to participate. Um, we welcome applications from across the world. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. And what does Ixo as a software system provide for you know a local community like Refi Cape Town, but also for all of these different challenges that you're getting in from the community? Because you're kind of asking for a lot there. What what is the tooling? What is a framework? And I don't know if you want to even walk us through some of what the software enables, but just be curious to get a glimpse of you know what's capable, what's possible with this system that you guys have built together. At Refi Cape Town, we started using the DAO tooling. Um, where members can join the DAO and submit uh, proposals for activities to be done. So we've been, our first ones were around catering. So should we get mm. catering from this local person in the community um, at a cost of 1,400 rand? And the members of, or the organizers of Refi Cape Town Local Node can vote on that. Playing around. It's like immediate governance model simple, right away. You can build simple use cases like and that. shared resource management. Wow. Exactly. And to manage a treasury, as more members attend our meetings, they, be, they can opt in to form part of the DAO uh, by getting a Refi Cape Town governance token. So they can submit proposals for activities and other people can vote on them. So those are the early use cases that we're doing. And now, venturing into um, hosting a, a local impacts marketplace where oh, cool. we want to work with local uh, social and environmental organizations and help them develop uh, on-chain digital uh, measurement, reporting, and verification assets, uh, impact assets, um, and host an impacts marketplace uh, where we can raise some funding and they can use the tools and um, we are the kind of operators of that uh, using the XO infrastructure. Yeah, and I think it's an interesting observation that like out of the 18 or 19 local nodes that we had through the first cohort, you guys developed a DAO, launched it, got engaged like right away. You know, so it seems to be a very much out of the box solution, which is purpose built for this kind of local community activation. I'm curious to get your take, Dr. Sean, on sort of where this all goes. Like with the introduction of the AI verification layer, all of these local communities all over the world spinning up local impact DAOs. Like, what's the kind of long term horizon? What's going to be possible, and what changes will we begin to see in society as a result of this technology? Remember at the start of Web 2.0, the thing that really ignited the use of the web and um, kind of gravitation online of all the organizations that didn't have a web presence mm. was WordPress, you know, an open source application that you could use um, to build your website and then plug in a, um, you know e-commerce capability or a, a blogging capability or whatever. And um, we're, we're, not, we're not the WordPress of the Internet of Impacts, but we do provide something a little similar, I think, in terms of being able to configure out of the box, as you say, or off the shelf, a white-labeled um, marketplace 
um, where you can define your branding and your um, uh, the terminology that you use. If you don't like the terminology DAOs, you can change that. Um, but under the hood, um, it is um, connecting to um, the EXO network and then also other chains uh, and enabling you to curate a marketplace or enabling a marketplace um, to come together um, where you have um, investors, projects, um, DAOs, uh, assets, um, oracles, and protocols. So those are the sort of key um, entities within within our, uh, our kind of uh, uh, digital twin uh, kind of ontology. Mm. Um, and so um, anybody can create a marketplace, and, and we have marketplaces developing both in terms of um, sectors, um, such as the clean cooking sector, as well as geographies, such as the um, Hong Kong so, um, Impact Data Consortium chain, which is for the social sector in Hong Kong. Um, so you define how your marketplace should operate um, and uh, what kind of um, services and uh, economy you want to create around that. And uh, we, we really just kind of wanted to make um, it really easy for organizations to be able to set up these marketplaces. And, uh, and then an extension to that um, is that we have built an exchange capability. So the exchange is a combination of cool. um, a kind of um, a, a venue where you can come and sell your impact assets. Impact assets, broadly, um, three sort of categories. Um, so you have the means of production of impacts, um, which generally show up as NFTs, um, such as the cook stove NFTs that give you the rights to the carbon credits that are generated off the cook stoves um, and accumulate some dynamically all of the data um, real time um, for that impact producing asset. Um, the second category is um, is kind of credits. So these are um, ERC-1155 equivalent digital certificates um, that are uh, tokenized uh, in, um, um, in a multi-token format um, or, or standard. And that, that can then allow you to trade carbon credits, um, um, education credits, health credits, et cetera. Um, and the, th- the third is, um, is around um, uh, uh, um, investments. So um, uh, sort of tokenized shares within impact bonds, for instance. So oh. we have this um, uh, alpha bond mechanism where you, anyone can issue um, a, uh, an impact bond um, and uh, raise finance for their, for their projects. And so we, we um, have developed a marketplace um, interface um, for any of these uh, marketplaces in different sectors or geographies to be able to host their own um, impacts exchange um, and then we're also working on um, a regulated impact exchange, which will operate out of Singapore, oh, wow. um, and that should be announced really soon. Um, and that is um, in partnership with a licensed um, exchange operator and custodian. Um, so this is kind of bringing the best of uh, kind of central exchange and decentralized exchange capabilities, um, but where the assets are fully described, fully verified, and impact focused or impact related. Um, so we're very really excited to kind of bring that to the world as a way of trading um, impact-related assets from any chain uh, and through a marketplace that um, becomes the kind of go-to um, uh, venue where you would want to come and um, buy or sell or invest um, in impact. I feel like you guys are at a really interesting turning point in your journey. Like you've been in this game for so long and you've built some very complex systems that are actually working in the wild, solving real problems for real people. And I'm curious to know, Dr. Sean, for people listening who really do want to get involved, what's the call to action here? What can they do to support your work and how can they access the power of this platform you've built? I I guess there's sort of three um, different um, target groups. Um, The first is anyone who sees themselves as an agent of impact. Mm. Uh, we would encourage you to download the Impacts X mobile application, um, which is kind of a combination of, of a crypto wallet um, and um, also a portal into the Internet of Impacts, the multi-chain Internet of Impacts. Um, and we've got a really cool roadmap around that, including um, integrating a, uh, um, um, an AI assistant um, a capability that we've been working on for a couple of years, actually. Uh, and... Uh, so that will be your, your kind of um, co-pilot, your buddy, for helping you to understand the world of impact and uh, optimize the investments that you make and, uh, um, and, and really kind of go on a journey um, where you feel fully empowered and you have this 
kind of superpower tool in your hands. So that's, um, that would be great if everyone kind of downloads the app and if you get involved in giving feedback um, uh, as to what features you'd like to see, um, but also um, buy the assets that are available. So there's offers in, in, in there, um, like the Supermoto Nifty. Um, and uh, so you can directly immediately get involved in investing in the impact economy and um, show it around to your friends, um, farm off the, the carbon credits that your, um, that your Supermoto cook stoves um, are generating, so use nice. that for your own personal offsets, send it to friends, etc. So there's really practical ways in which you can get involved. Nice. Um, the second, the second um, uh, target uh, uh, audience is um, collaborators who want to join the Impact DAO cooperative. Um, so this is a, um, a cooperative uh, vehicle uh, that is governed by the DAO tooling that we've developed um, for investing in the Internet of Impacts ecosystem. So if you feel that your organization would like to benefit from being a member, um, being able to uh, kind of work with others in um, creating interoperability between um, the services and the infrastructure that you have, um, or sharing market opportunities, um, or um, um, uh, co-investing into impact initiatives, um, either kind of building out new infrastructure and new tooling mm. or investing in specific projects, we would encourage you to come and contribute your work, um, your capital, um, your IP um, or market opportunities. And there's a formalized way of valuing those in, um, those contributions and giving you a share of, um, of the cooperative um, uh, value that is being generated. Um, the third is um, for investors um, who are interested in the commercial work that we're doing. Um, so we're, we have some very significant partnerships that we're busy working on in different sectors, and we're looking for strategic investors to come in um, at the level of our um, Singapore-based uh, company, um, and uh, we get the opportunity to invest in this whole capital stack and really be part of um, a really exciting and, uh, and, and huge opportunity space that we're all kind of fully fully engaging and uh, really going to market. Amazing. With. Well, for all those regions and impact investors out there, uh, can reach Dr. Sean Conway on Twitter. Um, Sean, do you just want to r- recite your Twitter handle real quick so that people can know where to find you? Te- Telegram is really easy. It's at Dr. Sean. It's okay, you want to you Okay. Um, or for all those regions and impact investors, you can reach Dr. Sean at Dr. Sean on Telegram. Feel free to hit him up. And what about you, Sean Ali? For those people in Cape Town curious about this story of regeneration, the tech that you provide, what's one dude to get involved? Yeah, reach out to me on Twitter, uh, OX Regen Sean. Uh, if you're in Cape Town, go. please let me know. I'd love to show you around and uh, show the work that we're doing. Hey, love it. I'm super looking forward to coming and see you guys in the flesh. It feels like the local node, the community you guys are gathering is really special. And uh, can't wait to see the nature as well. I've seen amazing pictures of the beautiful landscapes. Hey, Dr. Sean, can you just take me a layer deeper on like Great. what is the AI? How is it functioning? And why is this unique in your guys' system as opposed to you know the other solutions out there? In order to verify um, impacts, we need to have a theory of change and we need to understand the causality between um, what we're doing, what we're investing in, and the results that we expect to achieve. Um, now, um, if we look at the methodologies that have been developed through our traditional processes like consensus building, um, the methodologies of Vera and Gold Standard, for instance, for generating carbon credits, these um, are really quite cumbersome. They're not really updatable, and they're not very um, kind of intelligent in terms of the data feeds that come through. Um, they, they're, re- they're really quite kind of deterministic. Mm. And so what we've built is a framework for using causal AI um, to uh, firstly map out the theory of change and then encode that into the evaluation process. So we automate the evaluation of claims um, based on a probabilistic inference on the true positive um, kind of uh, um, um, probability of a claim um, uh, being, being, uh, being approved. And, and w- why is that important like to be able to create that prediction model? Like, What does that enable? Is it better price uh, integration and you can actually more accurately value the behaviors that are being done? Or is it that the system can scale? Like, What does that actually enable? All data really um, increases in value through opinionation. Mm. You know, there's huge amounts of information out there. 
um, even um, your uh, your uh, uh, feed on on Twitter, for instance, when people like a post that increases the value of the post. And so um, when we look at the opinionation processes in terms of evaluating claims, generally these have been slow, um, not very uh, uh, not very sort of um, scientific, I guess, um, more just um, uh, kind of uh, subjective mm. and um, and not so much data driven. So um, if we want to improve the predictive power, of the opinionation that we make over claims. And so really just to, to kind of step back a bit, these are claims about changes in the state of the world. So we want to prove that, um, that there is change from a baseline. Claims are coming in to, uh, to say, okay, these things happen, these outcomes are being achieved. Um, we first need to have a model of change uh, that makes sense in terms of causality. And then we need a way of bringing in the new data as that is um, generated or as that is um, process through the system in order to predict whether that change is actually happening or not. Um, and so doing this at scale and at the kind of speed and, uh, and cost efficiency that we need in order to make this accessible everywhere and for many, many use cases, mm. we have to use technology, we have to use AI. Sure. Um, and so, so um, this AI optimi- optimization in terms of just that one part of the um, the, the kind of service um, of evaluating claims is super important. Um, our vision has been to scale these technologies at internet scale. Mm. Um, so verify and finance uh, impacts at internet scale. And uh, I believe that we, we now really have the capabilities to make um, this claim uh, evaluation very automated and highly um, trustworthy in terms of um, the proofs that are generated and, uh, and and the confidence with which the evaluation results are delivered. Nice. May I love that. And I love how much of this technical uh, complexity you're able to hold alongside all the market drivers and all the social factors. And you've had a long career, Dr. Sean, and I'm curious if you had any parting words for founders out there in the crux of a bear struggling to get things over the line. Was there anything you learned through pushing through hard times that you want to offer to anyone else out there who's pushing through theirs? Um, so so it's the one thing that does resonate um, a little bit tongue-in-cheek um, is a... Um, um, is a saying that I, I heard some years back and it's kind of relevant right now because it, we're kind of at the 10-year mark, which is that mm. it takes 10 years to be an overnight success. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's kind of kept me going. Um, it has to happen this year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but really, um, you know, getting out of bed every morning with this unwavering belief in the vision um, is, is, is what keeps, uh, keeps me going, certainly. Um, you know, it has been quite a wild ride. Um, there have been many people who have been involved in that journey. And I'm super grateful to each one of the people who has been part of the journey and has made a contribution. Beautiful. Um, but um, ultimately, uh, you need one, at least one crazy person who, who just keeps the mission going. Doesn't let and, go. Uh, <laughs> no matter what. Doesn't let go, yeah. <laughs> That's it. Awesome, you guys. Well, thanks so much for your time. We've had a good run through a lot of different territory today. Uh, I know it's getting late in Singapore, Dr. Sean and Sean Ali. I very much look forward to uh, yeah, seeing you in Cape Town, trekking the hills, getting to know each other. Hopefully we can have some good food and good times. And yeah, man, you guys have been uh, yeah, a real pleasure to have on the show and look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks so much, John. Thank you, John. Peace and love, guys. Take care.